Good evening, everybody. My name's Jane Oliver. I'm from Clinica London. I'm delighted to see that we've got a good almost 80 people attending tonight. It's a very cold evening, and I hope you're all snug and wrapped up in your houses or your late offices. Jen Anakina, Evgenia Anakina, vitro retinal surgeon, is going to take us through a mystery tour of very interesting, probably some rare, probably some common retinal cases. Over to Jen now. So, mystery cases in retinal imaging, uh, compendium of curiosities. So, um, so I'm a consultant ophthalmologist. I work in Reading, and I also work at Clinica. Um, the outline of the talk, we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of what we're looking at today um, and about the vitreomacular interface, because that's very important um, in uh, most vitreoretinal dis disorders. Um, we're going to talk about urgent or maybe not um, cases and then a little bit about macular cases and, that th and then the weird and wonderful, everyone's favorite unusual presentations. So a little bit of anatomy. This is one of my favorite slides that I like to show um, to show that the vitreous is not just watery jelly but a nice cohesive ball um, of very structured jelly. And the retina, of course, has many layers, just to remind you of all the layers of the retina. So the vitreous um, has got loads of proteins in it and some firm adhesions to the retina. It's useful before birth and it degenerates throughout your life, eventually culminating in the posterior vitreous detachment, which we all know and love. That's fine. Um, so where is the vitreous attached most firmly? At the disc? at the macula, around retinal blood vessels, or at the aura serrata retinal edges. Have a little moment to think. It's at the aura serrata. So all the other adhesions are true, and they give rise to various vitreous retinal problems. Um, but the vitreous base is located at the aura serrata, and the vitreous never becomes dislodged from there. Um, so the other vitreous attachment, well, the fact that it's attached around the disc gives rise to the vice ring. At the macula, hence you get vitreomacular traction and all the macular disorders around retinal blood vessels. Hence, you can bleed when you have a PVD because of traction in the blood vessels. And the aura serrata attachments give rise to the peripheral retinal tears um, because you can't separate those attachments from the retina. There is a little picture of the posterior hyaloid membrane and the attachments to the retina. So PVD, just a reminder, happens in everybody commonly between your 50s and 70s, but actually studies show that it's a continuous spectrum um, between, well, pretty much from birth until the 90s. And some people um, develop it early and some people develop very late. Things like trauma, inflammation, genetics can make it happen earlier. And it arises due to the gradual liquefaction of the vitreous, it turning more watery, all the collagen fibers in it sticking together, forming lots of honeycomb empty spaces. And then it, there's a sudden collapse. When we say sudden, we mean hours to weeks, really. So it's sort of a, an ongoing process, an evolving process over a few weeks. And this, why am I dwelling on this? Well, because it's the cause or contributor of most vitreous retinal disorders. So back to those vitreous adhesions of the aura serrata, hence um, you get retinal tears. So here's the first lovely picture um, of the night of a nice U tear. Uh, which is quite easy to spot there. So should all retinal tears be referred or treated? Um, so again, I like to show all these different pictures to show different um, different tears. Um, you need to really establish when you're faced with one of these, is, is it acute or chronic? And also, is the patient having any symptoms? So if we say that these are all different patients, uh, picture A, picture B, C, and D, um, and say, Every patient here is asymptomatic. Say this is all an incidental finding on examination. Which one of these would you refer to a vitreoretinal retinal surgeon? Have a little think. Is it A, A and B, A, B and D, or perhaps just D, or perhaps just A? Have a little think to yourself. So from, from my point of view, the only one, say if the patient was asymptomatic and this was just picked up on examination, the only one that needs a prompt referral, an urgent referral, is D. Because that is that is a uter. It looks quite fresh. And there's a little bit of subretinal fluid under it. And that would be something we would definitely be treating. 
That picture A is very interesting because it's, it's, it's actually a very peripheral OCT. It's an OCT through those uh, peripheral round holes. And it shows you that there's, that there's a fair bit of traction, a fair bit of pull from the vitreous gel, even on those peripheral holes, which is something we're discovering now. And of course, this is the reason that 5% of these develop into detachment. But that's still quite low compared to a retinal tear, a U tear, which is 50% or over. Picture B and D are all quite chronic holes. There's atrophy around them. They're quite flat. There's um, pigment around them. And also you can see that um, C, for instance, is fully operculated. So the, the pull on that edge of the retina has actually been largely relieved because the, the, the retinal opercule has been pulled off. So only D. Um, the standard atrophic peripheral round holes um, have a bit of traction, but have a very low risk of detachment. So we wouldn't generally laser them unless the patient was very symptomatic and we couldn't find any other problem. So how do you know that a problem is acute? Well, it's all in the history. Um, vitreous hemorrhage, if there is some, probably means there's something active going on, retinal hemorrhages. How do you know it's chronic? Uh, if there's a bit of pigment, if the edges of the break are rounded, and if the retina looks quite thinned out and transparent. And also, if the patient has had time to develop an epiretinal membrane, um, then that um, also indicates that the problem's been there for a bit of time. So here's our first case. We're going to have a lot of these. This is a very picture-heavy talk because I know everyone loves pictures. They're fun to look at. So this is a case of trauma. Um, this is a 12-year-old boy who had a football to the eye. Um, the colour picture is not very clear, but it does show a full thickness macular hole and a bit of vitreous hemorrhage and a few retinal hemorrhages that were scattered around. You can see the retina in the centre is a bit pale, which is commotion, um, so bruising of the retina. And you can see on the OCT scan that uh, the quality is not great because of the hemorrhage, but you can see there's a sort of a ragged full thickness macular hole. So what do we do with these? Nothing, um, because these ones, the traumatic macular holes, almost the vast majority of them will close by themselves within the first few weeks. So this is one of our first acute cases. So. Here, it, here he is, same boy, about uh, two months post-op. So there's a bit of retinal atrophy. You can see there's a bit of sort of thinning and pigmentation there. And the hole has closed, leaving a little tough. There is some perturbation of the retinal layers. Um, and his vision is down. Um, but there's nothing sort of further to be done about it. The hole is closed. And this will be a permanent visual effect for him. So case two, this is another is this another of my sort of is it urgent collection. So hopefully everyone can recognize a retinal detachment. The blue arrow um, shows some persistence of retinal fluid. The red arrow um, shows flat retina that's heavily pigmented with the yellow arrow showing the very front of that pigmentation, which is the watermark. So this is a detachment which was bigger before and has gotten smaller. So something like this, you know, has been there a long time. So this would be something we want to see, but probably routinely. And this is unfortunate because this one um, is sort of macular splitting, it's fovea splitting. So it's probably having some visual effect. Um, but the patient usually presents asymptomatically with this issue. So here's a third case. Um, so what we've got here is a large retinal tear with some subretinal fluid and some laser retinopexy scars around it. So it has been treated. Um, and again, um, We'll have a think um, just in your own head whether you think that laser is uh, is well done, whether we need to do anything more. Do we have some answers in the Q&A? We can have some answers in the Q&A. Would, would anyone think that that, is, uh, that patient is fully treated and we can discharge them? Think somebody, nope. Nobody, nobody's brave enough. Um, there's a little gap in the laser. You can see down the bottom there. It's not really stretching all the way to the aura. So there's potential for that fluid to bleed around that laser um, and continue to detach the retina. Uh, so that's what I was concerned about. So this patient had some completion retinopexy done. So, um, so this case four, uh, we've got another retinal detachment. Um, and hopefully you can all appreciate this one looks a bit fresher. There is no pigment anywhere. The retina is all sort of wobbly and bullous. And the keen eyes might spot that there's also a macular hole. So this is probably there's another little retinal break temporarily for the, for the keen eyed. So this is probably a sort of either macular hole or combined macular hole peripheral tractional detachment. 
So uh, this is another case that was referred urgently with a retinal tear. Um, so is it urgent or not? Well, there is a little retinal tear. You can see the flap with the red arrow pointing at it. And there was another little one actually hiding more peripherally. Um, but there's that area of atrophy around it and some pigmentation, which tells you that it's been there for a long time and the patient is actually asymptomatic. So again, with these ones, I tend to sort of take them through the risk factors and offer them laser, but um, I don't insist upon it because laser does have some side effects um, and the patient sort of makes an informed decision. So here's a story of a retinal detachment. I thought it'd be nice to put some, um, uh, a sort of a, a case history up. So this is a patient that presented uh, with a retinal detachment, top left OCT, shows some fluid under the retina. Hopefully everyone can appreciate um, a, a bit of shallow fluid. The second scan is uh, then post-op. Everything's nicely attached and looking beautiful and they're happy. And unfortunately, a month later, they present with a, another detachment, quite bullous fluid, retina is floating around. So we stuck it back down again, and here it is nicely stuck, but unfortunately they've developed this epiretinal membrane with some tractional cystic spaces. And, and so they went on to have a membrane peel later on, actually. Um, so just a little evolution um, of all those things we mentioned in the anatomy slides. So how urgent is a detachment after all those, um, all those pictures? Um, well, Acute versus chronic is very important. You need to establish how long it's been there. And this is largely guided by patient symptoms, as I as I keep mentioning. Um, so if the patient says, well, I've had some floaters for a couple of days, uh, you have a good chance that it's it's only been happening recently. If they haven't had anything, anything recent happen in the last few weeks, um, I mean, it's it's likely more longstanding. Macular on or off, of course. Um, the macular on are sort of guidelines um, suggest treating these within 24 hours. Macular off as soon as possible, but practically speaking within days or weeks, um, depending a bit on the clinical history. And what makes detachments get worse quicker? Well, location. So um, though that chronic detachment we saw was temporal. A lot of them are inferior and the inferior ones can sit stable for a long time. But if a detachment is superior, gravity helps it progress. Watermarks, um, and then whether it's a uter or round hole, the round hole ones, again, they tend to progress slower because there's less traction, there's less incentive for the retina to lift. But in, if in doubt, refer urgently and we're happy to see. Um, little mention, um, we're having lots of pictures today. So I thought I would show you pictures of all the different types of detachments. So we've got our pregmatogenous um, arising from a retinal hole, which allows water inflow under the retina. And that overwhelms the RPE pump and the retina lifts instead of being stuck. Then we've got exudative. Here the RPE pump works fine, but we've got a leaky, um, sorry, RPE. So, um, and the, def uh, the pump um, can sometimes be defective. So the fluid production essentially outstrips the outflow um, and you get buildup of fluid under the retina. Tractional, so that's your diabetic ones or the ones arising due to other forms of scarring and combined. So that's where you get different types all together. So here's a nice regmatogenous one again, like we saw before with a large rent in the retina, causing a lot of subretinal fluid buildup. Here's a chronic round hole one, inferior, as I mentioned. These usually sit there for a long time without doing much. Um, and here is a regressed um, detachment. This we see, um, again, we get referrals of this, a sort of funny pigmentation. This is probably a detachment that's um, gone away by itself for whatever reason the fluid flow has balanced itself out. You can see a little tear where the arrows are. Um, for some reason, the detachment has spontaneously flattened and the patient's done our job for them. There's another couple um, of nice photos. Well, we've got a few questions in the Q&A section. Yeah, so here we go. So how soon should non-symptomatic old tears be referred? I am fairly relaxed about these. If you're confident that it's old and the patient's not symptomatic, um, I mean, sort of, not not urgent really sort of semi-routine um you could if you feel confident um you can have the discussion with the patient yourself of the risks that have benefits if you're not too sure then i'd probably refer you know within a month or so and we can have the chat um, and i take them through the risk like i say if i laser there's a slightly increased chance of you getting an epiretinal membrane if i don't laser there's a slight chance of you getting a detachment but once a tear has been stable for a long time that chance is probably not very high 
Um, is it the suppression of soil that causes border marks? Yes, it is. Um, it's the buildup of the, um, so, so the interaction of the photoreceptor outer segments and the RP um, it doesn't take place uh, when the retina is detached. And so all of that sort of um, metabolic uh, byproducts accumulate and that and also the RPE pigment migrates into the subretinal space and so so the watermark is just a consequence of that um yes yeah, so that's that's the watermarks again so so that sort of pigmented edge around subretinal fluid that shows you that it's been sat at that sort of at that border for a while uh, it tells you it's been there for for a while um good um so um on the screen again, top left, um, that's a giant retinal tear. So that's a big, big tear. So usually you get the, the U tears, which is sort of sitting there in one clock hour, or maybe a few of them. Uh, this is a sort of a giant U tear over three clock hours or more, and the whole retina peels off. So these require a slightly different technique for fixing. Um, uh, and then the bottom right one is uh, something called a dialysis. So that's where the retina detaches at the vitreous base at the very edge of it, often traumatic and often asymptomatic. Sometimes you just find these as an incidental finding. Um, so here we are. So there's another macular hole detachment and you can see a little bit of a raggedy macular hole. It's raggedy because the retina is all folded up because of the detachment and so it loses that round shape. And here's the tractional one just for a bit of difference. So this is a diabetic patient. You can see lots of sort of stringy bits pulling the retina up lots of abnormal blood vessels so this will be a little bit of a job to fix uh, with a vitrectomy there are no holes in this retina or you hope there's no holes in this retina and if you dissect all of the scar tissue away in time given a few weeks the retina just gradually sits down back in place so here's an exudative one i, th I said i would uh, fly through all the detachment types and um, so this you can see the pictures are just color images. Here's an OCT with all of these fluid humps, lots of multiple little detachments. And on the right, is, it's a, a, a fluorescein image of um, uh, just basically little spots that are detached. You can see them being dark. So this is a patient with something called VKH, von Cagnagli Herada. It's an autoimmune condition that gives you gives rise to all of these multiple detachments. But you'd be unlikely to see this. I've only seen a couple active ones. Um, but uh, if you do, it's a little bit of an interesting, um, interesting photo uh, for you. So just wrapping up our um, acute side. So risk factors for detachment. You're always going to correlate your pictures um, and your examination findings with the clinical information. So if you've got a myope sat in front of you with it, previous detachment in the other eye with a family history of retinal detachment who's also had a thump to the eye and a previous cataract top, um, you're pretty suspicious of any flashing floater symptoms um, in that patient. And you're going to have a quite a low threshold of getting any symptoms checked out by an ophthalmologist. And um, if you have a hypermetrope with no family or previous history, who's got a few symptoms, you're going to be a little bit more relaxed on the retinal detachment front. And there's a few other conditions, of course, which predispose to detachment, but that's a little bit beyond the remit of the talk. So when's a detachment not a detachment? We'll go, go back to our anatomy for a bit. Here are all the layers of the retina. So because of these layers, there's potential cleavage planes, potential weak zones um, in the retina. And that can give rise to retina skysis. So retina skysis, splitting of the retina, literally from Greek. Um, and that's essentially a retinal cyst. That's how I describe it to patients. It's a retinal cyst where the layers split and you get a bubble of fluid in between. And it sounds a bit less dramatic um, than the big word uh, of retina skysis. Um, you get different types. You get congenital, you may have heard of XRS. So that's the, the, the sort of the classic one in um, young males. Um, they have a very thin um, inner leaf uh, of the skysis, um, and it can affect the vision. Um, and then you get the acquired. So this is your typical degenerative one, usually in the hypermetropes, often in the infratemporal quadrants. And sometimes they're quite bullish. Sometimes they're quite standing quite proud, and they can look quite dramatic. And very, very easy to, to think it's a detachment. 
we never mind seeing these if there is any confusion because you know it, it can be difficult to to differentiate them sometimes but the clues are in the history again and um, you can get some secondary ones so you get the myopic ones so they're very short-sighted people with large staphylomas can get splitting of the retina just because of the pulling forces across it and then some of the other um, unusual ones and a couple of these i'll show you pictures of so how to tell? This is your history. Bilateral, hypermetropic, asymptomatic. That's your typical degenerative schisis. They're said to have a complete scotoma over it. So if you shine a tiny point of light using your slit lamp on your Volk lens over the area of the schisis, the patient will not appreciate any light at all. Now, in a detachment, they should appreciate some light still. Uh, but a little caveat that a very chronic detachment will also produce a complete scotoma. So it's not very reliable. OCT is the most reliable and, and objective way of differentiating if you can get a slice through that detached area. So back to our cases before everyone falls asleep. Um, this is a nice schisis. So this is an infra, sort of an infratemporal classic hypermetropic schisis. And that big white roll bit, um, oval bit, um, if anyone knows what that is, I will have comments in the Q&A. I wish we had prizes for answers. No one's volunteering. So that white oval is an outer leaf break. So the two layers of the schisis, the outer retina and the inner retina with the fluid in between, the outer retina can have quite large breaks, allowing free access of um, the fluid inside the schisis cavity to the RPE. And that's not a problem. These do not, are not a risk factor for detachment, really. They just sit there. We don't worry about them because they're not a complete communication to the vitreous cavity. Good guess on the RPE, Tara, because it looks exactly like that, doesn't it? It looks exactly like that um, if it was, for, say, the macula in an AMD patient. But this one, if you look at it 3D using your Volk lens, it's actually, it's floating, it's not flat. It's not at the level of the RPE, it's at the level of the retina, it's, it's higher up. Um, so there's another sky, so this is quite a bullish one, quite a dramatic one. All those little um, stars over it, the little white dots, um, they are Muller cell end plates. So they're where the cells got sheared off um, between the two layers. So the Muller cells, remember, they span the layers of the retina. And when you, when the sky develops, it rips them in half. And the little end plates just stay as little plaques like that on the surface of the schisis. So that's another schisis feature, these little um, kind of stars, as I like to call them. Um, so here's a, uh, another picture of mine. I just, I just thought this was fascinating. This was an OCT scan through a schisis, and it went through an area with an inner leaf break. Um, so the outer leaf is this little raggedy bit sitting down on the RPE, and the inner leaf... Um, it was all the way up here. And you can see the little spots of retina there. It's like tissue paper. It's just lots of lots of holes in the inner leaf. So that by itself is also not a problem. But if you had this inner leaf break associated with an outer leaf break, then you have a complete communication between your vitreous cavity and your subretinal space. And you have a potential detachment. So can a schisis progress? Well, as I alluded to, if you have complete communication, it can do. Degenerative types are usually stable. Um, occasionally, if they've got these breaks, uh, they can progress to attachment. But myopic fovea schisis, so schisis at the macula in short-sighted people, that, um, that can get worse. It's a bit of a special case. Um, so here's a, a, a nice um, series of uh, OCT scans on the right showing a, a highly myopic patient with a staphyloma and a lot of traction from that epiretinal membrane they've got, which essentially splits the retina initially, developing a schisis, and then pulls the outer retina as well, and then develops into a macular hole. So here's one I did earlier. So this is a bit of a poor quality scan because the patient's got quite a poor ocular surface. Um, but the top picture is a myopic um, macular schisis that this lady had with um, increasing schisis height uh, through consecutive follow-ups, dropping vision. Uh, her other eye was densely amblyopic with count fingers. This eye went from 612 to 618 to 624 and continued to drop. So we did a vitrectomy and ILM peel. And with a double island flap, 
and she ended up looking quite nice and the vision's gone back um, to 612 on a good day. Um, so that is one I did earlier. So this is what happens when one of those doesn't work. And this is another patient with a myopic macular sky. So it's very short-sighted. He's minus 16. Uh, he had a very large staphyloma, very bowed out back of the eye. Uh, I did have a tractomy island peel, uh, same as the previous lady, but unfortunately he redetached with this macular hole. He had a large posterior pole of retinal detachment. And so there was nothing to do but to try one of these macular buckles. So here's me holding this thing on the left. So it's a little spoon-like thing with a little button on the end. And you put that behind the eye and you stitch it to the wall of the eye. You can see it in the bottom scan. Bottom scan just pressing underneath the retina, essentially reducing the height of that staphyloma, flattening the back of the eye a little bit. So the retina has a better chance to sit down. So the retina sat down. Unfortunately, the macular hole didn't close, but the retina has sat down. So at least the detachment is not going to progress. So little word on hemorrhages. Um, any questions so far on anything so far before we move slightly on? Quiet. Um, so remembering those points of vitreo retinal adhesion that we talked about earlier on. Um, so at the macula, you can have bleeding, and you may have seen this. You may have all referred these patients urgently. You can have bleeding under the retina in the macular space from uh, choroidal neovascularization of whatever cause and from macroaneurysms. You can have peripheral bleeding from any vascular conditions, diabetes, uh, vasoproductive disorders. And you can have vitreous cavity hemorrhages, most commonly from a, a PVD. Uh, just from traction on a blood vessel, but also post-surgical um, or any of the above when, when very heavy can bleed into the vitreous. And so here we go is a little um, case series of hemorrhages. I think these are, these are just beautiful pictures. So this, the little white spot there just on the blood vessel is a macroaneurysm. So it's a, it's a large dilated spot on, on a blood vessel which has leaked and it commonly happens due to high blood pressure or transient rise in blood pressure, a cough or a sneeze. Um, and here you've got a lovely subhyloid bleed. This blood is trapped behind the hyaloid face, behind the vitreous in front of the retina and it's formed this little cup shape. And here's a scan of it just sitting as a blob on top of the retina. And this usually gets better by itself. You usually don't need to do anything. If it's not getting better, you go in and you literally just sort of pop this little blister and the blood drains and, um, and they get their vision back. So these ones are great, great to do. Isn't this, isn't this a terrific picture? I love this one. This is a diabetic patient. They've obviously had quite heavy laser in the past and they've got here and they've got some new vessels which are still active despite all of this laser. They're still active and they're leaking and they're bleeding and here's a little fountain of blood again getting trapped behind the hyaloid, behind the vitreous in front of the retina. And it's just like a, like a sort of a waterfall in the lake. So again, this is quite easily uh, sorted with, a, with an operation, but of course, diabetics have lots of other problems which, um, which can sort of impair uh, vision and surgical success. Here's another one. This is a patient with macular degeneration. You can see a few of the drusen and the RPE changes there, and they've had the subretinal hemorrhage. Um, these ones can be attempted um, surgically, but the success rates are not good, unfortunately. We've got um, we can inject a clot buster, either a, a drug, either into the vitreous or under the retina to dissolve the clot, and then a gas bubble into the vitreous, which wobbles around and tries to move the blood away, the blood that's been dissolved by the clot buster, and has about a 50% success rate of some improvement. But we still want to see any of these patients urgently, um, because we've got a wind, very short window of intervention before the blood clot. So usually, within a week or two of it happening, is our window of, of um, doing something about it. Hopefully everyone can recognize what this is. Slightly blurry picture, again, patient had cataract, um, but there's some hemorrhages in the top half um, of this retina. So this is a vein occlusion. This is a hemiretinal vein occlusion. Uh, so not a, not a central one, but half the retina is affected. Um, so these patients, uh, we do want to see because they can develop uh, ischemia. They can develop complications down the line. They may need treatment, but not all of them do. So we usually see them within a month or two. 
um, that's when, the, if they're going to have problems, they may start having problems. But it can be difficult to know when this happened, because often the onset of this is actually asymptomatic. So, moving on from, from, from the urgence and the bleeders to all things macular. Back to our anatomy, remembering our vitreo macular interface. A little bit of anatomy. So the anatomical macula is five, just over five mil across. The central area of the fovea is 1.55 mil. But it's, it's responsible for the highest acuity of vision with the highest density of cone cells. And the cones are very small in size, so there's lots of them packed into the space. And the central 10 degrees of retina occupy 50 to 60% of the visual cortex. So the part of the brain that's responsible for, for, for vision, over half of it is taken up uh, by that very central foveal area. So what do we get at the uh, at our vitreo macular interface? Well, we get the smallest perturbations in the fovea because of that sensitivity of vision can disrupt that perfect balance. Um, and so conditions arising at the vitreo macular interface are things like your retinal membranes and the puckers, macular holes, vitreo macular traction, myopic macular skysis as we saw already, and lamella holes. Now, I've put a query there. I don't like the term lamella holes. If anyone's heard a talk by me before, I probably would have said it. It's one of my it's one of my um my pet topics. I think saying lamella hole to a patient makes them worried. I think they get concerned. And the thing is, um, it's not nearly as dramatic a condition as a, a full thickness macular hole. I like to call them lamella defects. They're they're degenerative changes. Um, and so here is another storyboard, like we had for our detachment. This one's about the vitreo macular interface. This is a patient that also came to me. They were asymptomatic at the outset, referred because of an OCT scan performed by the optometrist. And so we've got a bit of traction there at the fovea. Fine, we're not worried. Um, after a few months, there was a little bit more traction. The outer retina started to get a little bit more lifted. Maybe the patient said, ah, maybe there's a little bit of distortion. Maybe a little bit more distortion here. There's a little... A disruption sort of a, almost a break happening an early break in the outer retina and lots more traction now if the outer retina in this third picture were completely preserved this patient may be asymptomatic because everything that happens however dramatic it looks up here up in the inner retina doesn't have as big an effect but this one did when it did go on to develop a full thickness macular hole about five percent of vitro macular traction develops into a full thickness macular hole over time Back to our cases. Here's an epiretinal membrane. There's a sort of a just shimmery white appearance um, over the macula. And here it is in profile. So these one may be asymptomatic again. They can look quite dramatic on scans. And um, this one's sort of fairly thick, a um, little bit of retinal disruption. Um, but I think the patient was seeing 6'9 and was quite happy. This is a slightly thicker one. This is a slightly anomalous one. There's probably something else going on in this patient. This is actually a different patient, but it just shows you that you can have this tractional cysts, this sort of fluid accumulation, which isn't an inflammatory or leakage process. It's just pull from the membrane, causing cavities to form in the retina. Jen, you're getting some questions. Am I? Aha. Pre-retinal hemorrhages, do they self-resolve? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. They can take some time. Uh, they can take, uh, well, something like a um, a vein occlusion or something like that. They, they can take months. Um, the subhyloid hemorrhage is that collection between the vitreous and the macula often resolves within weeks. But if it doesn't, like I say, surgery works very well. Vein a little done. Yep. Um, lamella defects. We're moving on to those. Well, well preempted. So just finishing off our epiretinal membrane story. This again is, is a single patient. Here is a nice epiretinal membrane, which they had back in 2019. Uh, in, uh, at the end of 21, the membrane had thickened and was causing a bit more traction. They were a bit symptomatic. And this is the point when they came to the retinal clinic from the general clinic. But by the time uh, they came to see me bottom right, where is the membrane? It's gone. You can just see a little floating um, thing up there in the vitreous. And that's one of these... Um, cases where it's said to be about 20% of membranes. I'm not sure it's that common, maybe it is, but it's supposed to be 20% of them which just scroll up by themselves and um, and disappear. So they can get better. Um, so 
Here we go. Everyone's favorite topic. So what is this? Is it a macula hole? Is it a lamella hole or a defect, as I like to say? Is it a pseudo hole or is it a macula schisis? Two, okay. We're getting twos and threes and twos and threes. Good, 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 good. I'm glad a lot of people are saying pseudo hole because that is what it is. Good. Um, I think pseudo hole was winning. I'm really pleased about that. Um, so the differences are, so it's obviously not a full thickness macula hole um, because you've still got some retina there. It's not a macula sky as we've seen one of those. There's a membrane, there's an epiretinal membrane on top. And then can you see that the foveal profile dips sharply? There's sort of a bit of a right angle there. So this is just caused by literally contraction of the membrane and all of that foveal area getting scrunched up. So it's just a distortion of the foveal profile and it's what we call a pseudo hole. So it seems like a hole, but it's not a hole. So it's, there's not actually any lamella cavitation there into the retinal layers. This is a pseudo hole. So these ones, if they're symptomatic, can get better with surgery because you remove the membrane and you remove the distortion. Um, so it's a pseudo hole, just distortion. Now, as opposed to degenerative lamella defect, as I like to call them. So here's a dramatic one, lots and lots of cavitation. Can you see all those irregular spaces? So this is what we call a degenerative lamella defect or lamella hole. This one has lots of this stuff piled up on top of the retina, all of this kind of spongy stuff sitting there. This is something called epiretinal proliferation. And we don't really know what it is, but it's actually been shown to have some protective effect. It's the retina trying to heal itself. So if you see that, that's what that is. Here's another a lamella hole, another degenerative lamella hole. There's lots of kind of cavitation. There's also this um, PED and a bit of RP perturbation. Now what these are, these degenerative lamella holes, they don't, um, they don't tend to progress very fast. They do progress, but the vision often doesn't correlate very well with the pictures. The pictures look more dramatic than the visual loss. And also these lamella defects, they're not very amenable to surgery. Surgery doesn't tend to work very well on these. Um, and so as opposed to our pseudo holes, which often do respond if the patient's symptomatic, these ones we tend not to operate on. So here's 19. Um, so this um, is another example of, because we're talking about the vitreoretinal interface, I thought I'd throw a diabetic patient in there. Top left is a diabetic retinopathy proliferative, obviously, there's lots of abnormal vessels, lots of traction. And here's an OCT, you can see that dramatic traction all across the fovea. And the second picture and scan is the same patient post-operatively when he had all the traction relieved and the retina sitting back down in a much nicer way. So this is a standard macular hole. We've talked about them lots. Uh, I just thought I'd show a picture. Now it's one of the most common virtual retinal things and I'm sure you've all come across these. These ones, again, obviously amenable to surgery. We do lots of them if they've been there for a long time. So this actually looks like a fairly long-standing macular hole just from the profile of it. Uh, they're less likely to close. And we can't leave a macular talk, um, a macular section of the talk without mentioning AMD. I didn't dwell on it. I am a retinal surgeon, but um, here's some atrophic, um, uh, atroph some atrophic spaces, some, some GA. Here are some drusen. But if either of these patients had a little bit of this subretinal fluid like this bottom scan, then this is obviously a macular referral, a two-week macular referral uh, for consideration for anti-VEGF injections. Um, throw this in here. Um, this could be anything. Uh, looking at it, um, the, I know this patient was a diabetic patient with diabetic macular edema, which has all these cystic spaces. Could be a vascular occlusive patient. They look very similar, but this retina is all kind of boggy. Um, the patient's unlikely to get uh, good vision, even with treatment at this stage, because this looks quite chronic. And I'm gonna I'm going to throw my post-op appearance patients there because I get these referrals quite a lot. Um, patients who's had retinal surgery, and their retina looks a bit like that, the bottom left, or a bit like that, top right. Um, and believe it or not, this is quite normal after retinal surgery. So the bottom left patient looked a lot worse pre-op. They had a very dramatic epiretinal membrane, which we removed. 
And all those cystic spaces take a long time to settle down, months, sometimes years, and sometimes some of them remain. Um, so you're comparing, really. You're comparing what they look like before and after surgery. You can never get it as good as nature. And this top right is a little residual outer retinal gap that you get after macular hole surgery very commonly. In this patient, it actually closed, uh, but often they don't. Um, and there isn't much we can do about that, but it is a normal post-op find. So the weird and wonderful, the final little stage of my talk, the, fu the fun bit um, that uh, a lot of people don't get to see. Here's case 23. And this is where, if anyone has answers for me, I'll be glad to hear them. This is a very interesting patient that I had. I have no idea what's wrong with her. She presented with a bilateral dense vitreous hemorrhage, the right one of three years duration, the left one of two months duration. I did bilateral vitrectomy. The right eye was a lot of ischemia um, and a lot of scarring, and I had no idea what was going on with it. Um, she also happens to be diabetic, but these changes are not very diabetic looking. And then she had this weird, leaky, lumpy bit here, which is some sort of vasoproliferative tumor. Uh, Moorfields also doesn't know what it is, um, but we've lasered her and we did some cryo, and she's got a bit of this subretinal fluid here, which waxes and wanes. Um, so anyone has answers for me, uh, please on a postcard. Well, it's a nice picture. And this is case 24. So this, some, this is somebody I just saw a few months back. Um, this is a lady who got into a drunken fight uh, and unfortunately had a bottle broken over her eye, which caused a globe rupture. Now, globe ruptures are, of course, very dramatic and usually um, sight-ending uh, complications. But in this case, yes, eels, yeah, it could be in the, for the previous one. Some sort of vasoporifter thing. Um, for the previous patient, morphos are thinking of doing a radioactive plaque on it. We'll see. So this trauma lady. The reason I've put this up is because I think it's astounding. So this is one of her early uh, optos pictures. There's a lot of hemorrhage. All this white and red stuff is vitreous hemorrhage. You can see the retina is all kind of folded, but this isn't a retinal detachment. It's a choroidal detachment. It's choroidal hemorrhage um, at the site of her break a choroidal break uh, she has done remarkably well her retina is attached and her vision is okay which i think is astounding and she keeps refusing to have her vitreous hemorrhage washed out which will make her vision essentially perfect um also interesting so this is another trauma um any takers for what that is This is a another actually 12-year-old boy, 12 or 13-year-old boy. Another football injury. Yeah. Yeah. Choroidal rupture. Classic choroidal rupture. You can see the disruption here on the OCT, and you can see this sort of classic white, uh, white line. So this is the, the, the sort of contra coup injury where the the ball hits the front of the eye, the back of the eye gets stretched and the choroid ruptures and then comes back together. Um, so yeah, his vision's down. Uh, I think he's about 624, 636. Um, this can give rise to choroidal neovascular membranes downstream, but not many of them. Usually it just settles, but unfortunately this is permanent. And unfortunately for him, it goes right through his fovea. Um, but that's what that one was. So this uh, was briefly mentioned earlier in the talk. Um, as a cause of detachment, this is an optic disc pit. Um, in this picture, you can't see it that well, but it's sort of this little gray oblong thing on the, on the temporal disc. And here on the OCT, you can see a disruption um, in, the, in the wall of, of, of the disc, uh, basically, which is the connection straight to the, um, essentially the, the fluid space of the brain, which is where the fluid comes from. Um, and the fluid leaks through that opening and then into the retina and under the retina. And you get these sort of splitting skittic changes and you can get retinal detachment as well um, at this site. Optic pit, absolutely. Um, yeah, this is this is my a little mention again of a post-op appearance. This is an interesting one. So first of all, you've got this little scar here. That's, re that's um, retinal touch. That's where we've literally picked up. This patient had a, um, an ILM peel for a macular hole. The macular hole's closed. 
Uh, but this is where we picked up the ILM to peel it and it just caused a bit of retinal trauma that can happen. Um, these, are, you can probably with an eye of faith, it's more obvious in the black and white photo, which is why I put up, you get these trigger stripes, these sort of um, striations in the, um, around the fovea. And this delineates the area where we peel that inner layer of the retina, the ILM. And this is something called DONFL, D-O-N-F-L. It looks much like choroidal folds, doesn't it? But those tend to be radial um, and they tend to be very regular and linear, whereas these are all kind of um, just kind of look a bit painted on. Dissociated optic nerve fiber layer, DONFL. It's a rare complication. It's actually minimally visually symptomatic. Some patients, you know, might have a small reduction in sensitivity in that area of retina. But the pictures can, this is quite a sort of a soft picture, but um, you can get more dramatic um, impressions of it, especially if the fundus is more heavily pigmented. It's more obvious. Everyone recognize all, what that is, hopefully. Inferior, funny bit, uh, with no retina, no choroid, not very much. This, this is a coloboma. This is one of my patients with bilateral um, chorioretinal and iris and lens colobomas. So this is an embryological defect. So when the eye is forming in the womb, it fails to join up at the bottom and you get a gap through all the structures of the eye. Um, so again, so they've got a complete visual feed defect in that area. Makes for a dramatic picture, but essentially they're living with it and they're fine because the fovea is fine. Yeah, coloboma, absolutely right. And my, for my final one. So this is a post-surgical patient. I thought I'd put this up because um, uh, none of my trainees have um, guessed this so far. So I thought I would try this in the talk. And um, this is, I will give you a clue that this is also a trauma patient. This is an unfortunate lady who uh, who fell and hit her eye on a, on a um, corner of a cupboard. Uh, I'll give you another clue that she lost her lens through the choroidal rupture. So she, she had a globe rupture, which was repaired. And this is her after her second surgery with me when I went in to repair the retinal detachment as developed as a result. So. Jay, any any ideas? Um, I wonder if it's a ciliary body uh, detachment or hemorrhage, so very anterior, because it looks mu very much like an anterior melanoma that would be coming forward, because I saw that shadowing. It but does, remember, doesn't it? Hang on. I'm not <laughs> retinal, so I'm here to learn as well. <laughs> It's good. It's a good attempt. It's a good attempt. Sorry, if my um my thing stopped sharing for some reason. Let me share it again. Uh, one second. Uh, share. Yeah. So um, this um, so she's lost not just her lens, but she's also lost her iris. So you're seeing complete aniridia. Oh. That's what the first picture is showing. There's a little tiny bit of iris still on the sort of um, uh, on the edge there. Uh, but she lost most of her iris. And you're also seeing some some stitches, these um, crisscross bits. So that's some stitches that I've put across uh, across her pupil plane. Um, and the reason I've done that is to form an artificial iris because I've had to put oil in her eye because she had a retinal detachment. And the oil, if you don't put these in, will just come forward and the whole cornea will go white and the pressure will shoot up. So you have to form some sort of separation between the anterior and posterior chambers. So that's what these stitches are doing. And she's formed this lovely inflammatory membrane over them, which just looks like a funny uh, checkerboard iris. But I throw that in as a, as a little bit of um, as a little bit of a random interest. So thank you very much. That concludes the talk and I'm nicely on time. So apologies for the delayed start. I'll take any remaining questions now. Do full thickness macular holes cause a Schaefer sign? No. It's interesting, though. Why wouldn't they? Because it is a retinal break. That is interesting. But I've never seen a Schaefer sign in a macular hole. 